yes, hello, uh, we're back again, and um, I've been threatening slash promising this for a while. Um, so, hello to everyone who wants to know about ecologism, hello to everyone else on the internet, hello to Jason Isaacs, and all of the other things uh, that make life worthwhile. So, um, yeah, ecologism, this is probably going to be a double, um, at least, possibly more. Um, we'll see where we get to. Um, I really have to say that I think the textbook uh, could have done a better job uh, on this one. Uh, I'm not entirely sure which textbook you're using. We're using the big thick doorstop, which is everything in one place. I think it's McNaughton. Um, the rest of the book's really, really good. Uh, ecologism, I think, rather misses a trick. Um, and I've been wrestling with this for a while. Um, but I think I've got something that may help you through it. Uh, so uh, once again, this uh, these videos are uh, intended for those who are studying the uh, NXL politics exam, but they should help you with any politics exam you're doing. And uh, if they do help, let me know. If they don't, well, you can also let me know because I'm big enough to roll with that sort of thing. Uh, but if they do work, um, they do help, then most of all, please tell your friends because this is not a zero-sum game. Okay, so uh, on with the show. Um, there's a lot of background stuff here that I put in when I first did this presentation and I can't bring myself to take it out. A, because it's in the textbook, B, because it's just quite nice. Um, so these are your four laws of ecologism. Uh, probably not going to come up in the exam, but not worth just pausing and having a read of those and just making sure that you're happy with them. Um, much the same uh, with this, except this is actually critical to the exam. Uh, this is what you're going to have to know. And again, um, the uh, this one here is basically the questions that you are going to get asked. Uh, to what extent do different schools of ecologism uh, differ over this, uh, whether that is the state, the environment, human nature, um, or the economy, or a wild card that they might choose to chuck in. I have a sneaking suspicion I know what it might be, but it's, it's just a guess. Um, we'll come to that uh, when uh, when when we do. So um, there we go. That's your dictionary definition. Um, and there's a picture of the Earth. Hurrah. And um, there's no doubt um, that, uh, that the environmental movement really took off, really started to develop a bit of momentum when these pictures started coming back from the space program, because at that point we started to realize that, you know, the planet was perhaps even more beautiful than we had previously imagined it and definitely more fragile and and, and within that we have the sense of the whole we, previously if you're on, if you're on the planet earth the place look, just looks flipping vast uh, however when you see the planet like this particularly when you see it uh, like that uh, you start to realize um, just how tiny we are uh, in the grand consequence of things this is from the cassini probe in 2013 uh, not the original pale blue dot i'm going to link off to that uh, in the um, in the footnotes because uh, it's just great and it's well worth listening to so pale blue dot in footnotes there we go I'll remember to chuck that one in later um, these are some definitions and some key ideas that you need to get down uh, this is what you're going to be uh, the, this is going to be the the sort of phraseology you're expected to chuck around in your essay you need to be able to explain what all of these concepts mean um, and use these things use these terms and use these concepts to uh, substantiate your questions you can read that there's nothing necessarily typical necessarily difficult there um, but uh, yeah make sure you use those in your essays now this is where I kind of depart from the textbook a wee bit um, and whether or not you're going to uh, use this in an essay, I, I don't know. Uh, we'll find out. Um, but I think it may help you understand uh, where uh, environmentalism is coming from and uh, give a little more context and perhaps texture uh, to some of the stuff uh, that we have in the book. The book sort of deals with, the textbook sort of deals with the environmental theories it stands and, and there's no sort of context suddenly we're shallow green and deep green um, but I think that we need to put that um, or we need to see that through the historical mirror and not just the his history of civilization but actually the history of the species uh, we're looking at the difference there between thousands of years and thousands of thousands of years and um, that's important because our fundamental and um, evolutionary nature is very very different from our historical nature 
uh, if you will. Civilization may be two, three, four thousand years old. Uh, the species, hundreds of thousands of years old. And that is significant. And don't forget that we are, um, well, I, I'm pretty sure we can go out on the evolutionary thesis here. Uh, we are ourselves the product of an evolutionary process that stretches all the way back, um, certainly 65 million years to the last reboot. And um, yeah, I find that fascinating. Uh, but what that means is that there are bits of our brain that are incredibly old, right in the center of our brain. We have a reptilian brain, but I'm, I'm getting off the target. I'm very, very sorry. And uh, we'll move on. Right. Uh, by the way, that doesn't mean we've got a lizard living in the middle of our brains. It just means that we have a very ancient brain center that has remained unchanged for millions of years and is actually common uh, in some reptiles. But anyway, right. This is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about an initial state. And then that initial state um, has essentially evolved to a civilized state. And the question then becomes, well, what happens after that? So this is your initial state, if you will. Uh, this is where we are. And the question is, are we going to go to this point? Um, the shallow green um, environmental thesis thinks, well, we can basically stop there and make things better. We can do what we're doing there and be perfectly happy. Deep Green, however, says no, we, we need to move through. We need to move to a post-civilization uh, way of thinking because civilization as it stands is incompatible with long-term environmental benefit. So the, the step from the civilized human to the environmental human or the post-civilization human is the movement from shallow green uh, to deep green. Now, this is not in the textbook. Uh, this is just my way of trying to explain it to you. And I hope that it helps. Um, we can see it in society. So in society, in your initial hunter gathering society, well, they're working in small hunter gathering tribes. They are essentially contained by Dunbar's number. I've mentioned this in a few of my videos. Uh, if you haven't looked it up yet, uh, you should do. It's about 150. And this is the effective or practical limits uh, of the Gemeinschaft. I've mentioned Gemeinschaft a number of times. Uh, but Dunbar's number basically says the number of functional relationships that a human or indeed any uh, any animal uh, can, uh, can contain is finite. And uh, they've done some sums and they've done some experiments. And for human beings, it works out, we'll, we'll give or take about 150. And so that is the, that is the uh, effective limit of... Um, Interper functional interpersonal relationships that any individual uh, can contain. I can give you an, I can give you an analogy to try to explain that. So imagine there's a teacher and the teacher has um, a fairly loose approach to marking, uh, but that's okay because he's dealing with a very very small class. And so in the context of the environment, uh, in the context of the progress uh, through the course. The teacher knows exactly where every student is because the relationships with the student are a, entirely healthy, uh, but be they're personal and um, uh, and functional and uh, they are predicated upon the teacher's understanding of the individual and uh, the progress that individual is making and the difficulties that individual is encountering. Now, let's assume that the class gets bigger. It's going to be hard to sustain that sort of personal uh, interaction between the teacher and the student. And as the class gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, these relationships become, or these, the, these connections between the individuals get stretched to the point where eventually they snap. And... Um, you have to move into a different model of organization. And so then you have to start doing lots and lots of tests and lots and lots of marking and lots and lots of record keeping. So you uh, know exactly where all of your students are at any given time. Hypothetical example. Um, anyway, that's Dunbar's number. There is an, an analogy to try to explain Dunbar's number, but we tend to find in the natural world that uh, uh, every group, every social organization, be it whales or dolphins actually dolphins are quite big but they're sort of fairly looser organizations um or um bonobos or chimps or lions uh has a specific number after which it becomes unwieldy and the society breaks down anyway the the reckoning is that's about 150 of those and i'm sorry that was a massive digression but this is what i this is what i do in my spare time anyway so um that is your hunter-gatherer system. We're, we're kind of topped out there at about 150. Uh, but as we move into a larger scale, as we move into the civilization model, then we're capable of manipulating nature to achieve specific goals. 
Now, in the Hunter Gathering Society, we're not doing that. And the idea, really, of this sort of anthropocentric view of nature is that there is an inherent gain in doing that. There's a reason why that's a good thing. Now, whether it's eradicating smallpox on one hand or uh, Shakespeare on the other, what we've done is that we have to all intents and purposes, manipulated nature for a specific end. You don't see necessarily hunter-gatherer tribes composing folios of thousands of pages. There will be an oral history. They will have their own, their own, their own, um, their own myths and legends that are handed down. Um, but um, it's quite another thing to start inventing things like the printing press and um, the smallpox vaccine and that sort of stuff. So we are essentially manipulating nature there to achieve specific goals that are not necessarily um compatible with the well-being of nature but then as we move into the post civilization or the post or the environmental human then perhaps we're looking at seeing that being scaled back uh to smaller operator smaller societies operating uh, within nature so similarly we see that transition here as we look at the state and as we look at the economy um your hunter gathering societies have no sort of formal structures of organizational leadership it's a it's a loose personal uh, organization yes they do have leaders and societies with leaders tend to do better than societies without uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to move into a massive organization of structure and organize uh, and uh, and control um, however if you are running a civilization and you have a mechanistic view of nature that is there for you to exploit and to do stuff with it whether again it's performing plays at the globe or uh, eradicating smallpox or putting men on the moon then um, you need that large scale uh, operation that large scale organization so you can effectively exploit nature for that gain whatever it is uh, then as we move into post-environmental uh, or the environmental human uh, we see a return to that holistic approach where we start to prioritize the uh, interests of the environment similarly over over here uh, that switch occurs there as we move from civilization to whatever comes next, if indeed anything does come next. And I am just about out of time. So that is just a way of trying to put it in context. The book really focuses on shallow green and deep green. Um, we can also look at a sort of pre-lapse, a pre-fall version, uh, pre-civilization version of human, where we lived in much, much smaller communities and we lived in harmony uh, with nature. This is this is somewhat utopian, but you know that there, there is real merit in this, um, and certainly there's a historical record to back it up. Um, that gives us a thought, a sort of three model system that we have pre pre civilization. We have civilization. Civilization. If civilization is going to be reconciled with nature, then we need to go down shallow green uh, roads. If we decide we can't reconcile uh, the interests of society. Uh, or civilization with nature, then we need to move to something else, and that's going to be the deep green. So pre-fall to civilization to post-civilization are more or less analogous to the sort of environmental ideal, shallow green and deep green. I hope that makes sense. Um, if it doesn't, uh, bear with me. We'll go into the next the next presentation, and uh, hopefully that will give you a little more context, a little more depth. Uh, to look at this and um, I'll see you uh, I'll see you in there hey take care bye now boom music there we go hey I'll get the hang of this one day bye